Welcome to the Droma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Hi, I'm Adasa Stein. I'm a fourth year medical student at SUNY Downstate. I serve on the Joma Teen Health Committee and I'm an interviewer for the Joma Specialty Spotlight Podcast. The Specialty Spotlight Podcasts are geared towards pre-med and medical students interested in learning about different medical specialties. Today, I'll be interviewing Dr. Aliza Kasai. Chevy Kasai, MD, is a general and trauma surgeon in Denver, Colorado. She is a graduate of Base Yaakov of Denver and Stern College for Women. Following a two-year post-bachelor research fellowship at the NIH, she attended medical school at the, tech, at the Technion in Israel with induction into the Gold Humanism Society. She returned to Denver to complete her residency training in general surgery at the University of Colorado. She completed a research fellowship in trauma surgery during her training, and her research has been published in multiple medical journals, including the Journal of the American College of Surgeons, Injury, and the American Surgeon. She lives with her husband and three children in Denver. She is involved in many organizations within the local from community. Dr. Kasai loves skiing, running, traveling, and spending time with her family. So Dr. Kasai, uh, first question Hi. for you. Why did you choose a career in medicine and what characteristics make one a good fit for a career in medicine? Sure. So I chose a career in medicine because I always liked solving problems. Um, I liked puzzles as a kid and, you know, critical thinking sort of problem solving things in high school. Um, And I always felt like I had a knack for science. And those two things sort of pushed me towards a career in the sciences. Um, My mother is a registered nurse. And so um, I had some exposure to um, medicine and to surgery specifically um, growing up. And it just, when looking at other uh, careers in the health sciences, it was really sort of what pulled me the most as opposed to nursing specifically, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, and then other things I looked at were, you know, going to PA school and whatnot. But I just said I thought that medicine was really the best fit for me um, and um, never looked back. And then in terms of characteristics that I think make people a good fit for a career in medicine, that's a like really broad question. And I think sort of changes depending on what specialty you end up pursuing. But in general, um, things that I think are important for anyone pursuing a career in any medical specialty are um, being a team player, um, having grit, and having integrity um, above and beyond uh, above and beyond everything else is the integrity portion of it. Um, being ready to work really hard and being meticulous and having attention to detail are also things that I think make a difference and help you get ahead in medicine. Yeah, I love how you articulated that. Uh, I definitely think like that encompasses a lot of um, what I see makes for a good team member in, uh, in throughout my rotations and a good doctor. <laughs> Why did you decide to go into the field of surgery? Yeah, it's a really loaded question. It's, it's funny because I started medical school knowing that I was going to be a nephrologist. Um, I, um, like you articulated before, I spent a couple of years um, doing research at the NIH when my husband was finishing um, his uh, studies in Baltimore. And so uh, I worked in a lab where we looked at renal pathophysiology and allograft nephropathy and, uh, you know, and kidney transplants in mice and whatnot. And so I really was interested in renal pathophysiology and I, I knew that that was what I was going to do. And then um, I started med school. Um, I took first year anatomy. I spent the summer after my first year of medical school shadowing a transplant surgeon who I, I honestly, that was just by chance because I said, oh, I'm interested in becoming a nephrologist. Can I see what you do on the other side of things procedurally? Um, and I had shadowed um, a couple surgeons growing up, um, like an orthopedic surgeon who I knew from um, my parents who worked at my mom's hospital as a kid, but it never really called me. But that summer after my first year of med school that I spent uh, watching them do kidney and liver transplants completely transform my view where I said, this is just amazing where I'm not palliating a problem. I'm not managing a chronic problem or a chronic disease, but I can actually, in the course of a few hours, take someone who is on the brinks of death and fix them. 
And it was just completely eye-opening for me and inspirational for me. And I just said, you know, I think that this is, I just, I felt a calling and I felt like this is really what I want to do. Um, and so that's why, that's, that's when I decided to go into surgery, I guess. But in terms of specifically why, I think the factors, if I sort of break it down and look back, that uh, called to me were the fact that I saw that this was something where I, I talked about before how I like to solve problems and that's why I wanted to become a doctor. And I saw specifically in surgery, the ability to have a specific problem rather than a set of problems or a problem list. You have one specific problem and you can offer a solution to that problem. Um, and I just loved that mindset and the ability to um, solve problems in a rapid way like that. And um, I also just liked the lifestyle of it in that, you know, you're seeing a patient, you're able to tell them, yes, that's a problem that you have, that's a disease that you have, I can fix that. I liked that rather than chronically managing problems. Um, and I enjoyed the technical aspects of it also. I mean, in medical school, it was fun to watch and sort of, you know, get involved in little bits of it, you know, suturing and this and that. But I liked the fact that you were working with your hands, you're doing things during the day rather than just seeing things or talking about things. I liked that aspect too. It was fun. So, um, <laughs> Because it's fun and you get to solve problems. Yeah. I, I do think that is very unique to surgery. Like you were saying, kind of like the instant gratification that you, you're you able to change a patient's life for the better very quickly. Exactly. So, and yeah. to those people who are wondering, okay, well, so then you said you're a general trauma surgeon and not a transplant surgeon. Yes, that's very true. Um, I sort of changed trajectories, obviously, during residency, you know, knowing full well that, you know, transplant surgery wasn't necessarily a lifestyle um, a lifestyle specialty that would, you know, make sense for me or a subspecialty that would make sense for me, um, you know, as a, as a firm wife and mom, but um, definitely looked into that. But, um, you know, general and trauma surgery made sense for me because trauma, as I think we'll probably get to later in this um, interview when we talk about, you know, my, my daily life is a little bit more shift work. Um, and so I'm able to sort of manage all of that. And it just made sense for me. But it's the same sort of thing where someone comes in. I mean, I had a guy come in um, a few weeks ago who was uh, stabbed in the heart. And, you know, you open up his chest, you sew the hole, you fix the problem and save his life. So wow. that's pretty instant in terms of being able to have a problem and fix it and have someone walk out the door of the hospital. So. That, that's pretty wild. Wow. Uh, okay. So next question. Can you walk us through a typical day for you as a general surgeon? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, it sort of depends on the day because like, like you articulated before, um, you said general and trauma surgery. So my days when I am working in my elective practice are very different than my days when I'm on call. So my typical day as a general surgeon is um, just like the typical, you know, typical day that, you know, any person who has any job has where I come to the hospital, but instead of going and sitting in an office, you know, being an accountant or whatever, I go to the operating room. So my days um, when I have elective cases usually start at about um, 7 or 7.30 and usually go until about 3.30 or 4 o'clock and, um, you know, I'll fix um, whatever problems people have that they saw me in the office for. And so sometimes typically on a day like that, I'll do, you know, four cases. And so I'll take out someone's gallbladder, I'll fix a couple of hernias, I'll excise some lipomas, but it just kind of, um, you know, it runs the gamut of, um, you know, bread and butter general surgery and doing those things on a day where I'm in the OR all day. Um, there are other days where um, I see patients in the office. And so that's a half a day a week. And so on those days from nine until 12, um, you know, I see patients and evaluate the surgical problems that they were referred to me to, you know, see me for. Um, and then the days of when I'm on trauma call, um, you know, all, all bets are off. And so basically from 7 a.m. until 7 a.m. the next day, so we do 24-hour shifts, I am the in-house um, surgeon who's there for anyone who comes in, whether they were stabbed in the heart or whether they have appendicitis or anything in between, I am the person in the hospital who's there ready to, you know, evaluate those patients and see them and, you know, perform whatever urgent surgeries they need within that 24-hour period. The nice thing about that, though, is that at 7.01 on the morning after being on call, I walk out the door and pass on whatever's left to the next surgeon who takes call. Um, and so what I was saying before kind of resonates with that is that it's very, very much shift work. And so I'm able to do that, let's say on a Thursday morning until a Friday morning, and know that at 7.01 on a Friday morning, I'm going to go home, take my kids to school, get them ready for school, make Shabbos, do whatever I have to do. What specific challenges did you face as an Orthodox woman during your surgical residency? And what challenges did you face pursuing a, spe a specialty atypical for women in the Orthodox community? 
Well, that's a very loaded question. I'm going to try to break it down. So um, specific challenges I faced, before even addressing specific challenges I faced as an Orthodox woman, let me address specific challenges I faced as an Orthodox person, which, you know, boil down to Shabbos and Yentif. And I think that, you know, you're going to have those sorts of issues unless you find a Shomer Shabbos program, which in surgical specialties uh, really as far as I know, are not very existent. Um, those are problems you're going to face in any, um, you know, in most specialties at most residency programs. And for the most part, people were very understanding. I tried to, you know, treat a lot of, you know, Sundays for Saturdays and stuff like that. Sukkis was a challenge every year because I always took off for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur um, and our vacations were sort of blocks. And so we weren't able to take off three days here and four days there. It was like you had to take week-long blocks. And so I sort of had to sacrifice something for something else because if I wanted Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur off, you know, I couldn't take off a four-week block, including Sukkis too. And so Sukkis was always very tough. Um, you know, I think you have to have um, very close uh, communication with um, whoever your Rav is. And um, I did, along with my husband, and sort of posed any sort of Shilohs that came up as they came up, you know, in terms of getting to the hospital on Shabbos, when I was allowed to go, how I was allowed to go, how I was allowed to come home, if I was allowed to come home. Um, so those were challenges I faced as, you know, an Orthodox person in general. Um, as a woman, because I don't think that those are specific to women, I think the toughest things, you know, for me as a woman were being a mom and then, you know, being a pregnant mom during residency. Um, you know, some of the other things are just, you know, funny things, right? Like people uh, no noticing that my hair always looked, you know, amazing. I was known as the surgeon with um, the most beautiful red hair um, at the university hospital when I was a resident because my hair always looked great at the end of the day because I would just go into the bathroom and put my hair back on. Um, so that's kind of funny, but I don't know if that's really a challenge. It's just funny. Um, but I mean, it was, it was always awkward to figure out how to, you know, take off my shape in a way that wasn't awkward and then put on a cap and leave it on all day. But, uh, you know, really, truly, you know, all, all kidding aside, um, issues that face, you know, that women specifically face are issues sort of relating to, um, you know, child rearing and child bearing because, you know, child rearing and stuff like that. I have a wonderfully supportive husband who has, you know, been by my side throughout all of this, but there are still things that fall on the mom, right? Like, I mean, I was always the one, you know, even as a resident who did doctor's appointments and dentist appointments and, you know, orthodontist appointments and PTA and all that sorts of stuff. Um, you know, and my husband has his roles and his tasks and all that, but, you know, those things were challenging as a resident to be like, well, yeah, you know, I, I need time off because my kids actually have a dentist appointment this morning and I'm going to have to do that. Um, and so I think some of that comes down to asserting yourself um, and, you know, this, this is what you need. They understand that you're a parent. They understand that you're a human. And I think that residency programs are a lot more understanding of those things now than they were, you know, 10, 20 years ago, but even five years ago where, you know, at the program where I trained, they now have a, there's like a half a day off um, per month that people have that is built into your four week rotations where one day you're only there for a half a day and no matter what you leave at 11 o'clock, that way you can go do your doctor, your dentist, uh, you know, get your hair cut, whatever else you need to do to take care of yourself. There's time built in. Now, is once a month enough? I, you know, I don't know the right answer to that. Um, you know, it certainly is not necessarily enough for parents, but it would have helped me during residency. So, you know, those were challenges I faced as, you know, from mom. Um, and those are challenges that, you know, every mother faces, you know, the uh, non-religious ones or non-Jewish ones as well. But in my class, I was the only woman. Um, no, I was, I was one to two women, I'm sorry, but I was the only married woman and I was the only Jewish woman. And so, um, you know, that sort of put me in this unique predicament. Um, and then pregnancy was a challenge, um, obviously, but I think my program was incredibly supportive. Um, I had a program director who um, is just an angel and was supportive of everything and anything I needed, you know, OB appointments and, um, you know, trying to, you know, reschedule my vascular surgery rotation because there's a lot of radiation exposure and having that be, you know, after pregnancy and making sure my maternity leave was, you know, appropriately uh, spaced and long enough and reassuring me that I can come back when I was ready and no one pushing me to come back before I was. Um, you know, I mean, the entire program was very, very supportive of things like that. And so I would encourage just open communication um, to help obviate those challenges because, you know, like when I found out I was pregnant, I would talk to my program director and say, hey, here's what's going on. Um, here's where I'm at in my pregnancy. Here are the things I anticipate I'll need. Here are the things that I'm going to do to try to solve problems that I anticipate as they come along. Here are the things I might need your help with. Um, and I did the same with attendings who are all very supportive. I mean, you know, most surgeons are parents themselves um, at some point in their lives. And so they get that this is just, you know, a natural part of life. And I think that surgery in that sense is becoming a lot more humanistic and a lot more supportive of um, our trainees. Um, but those were the biggest challenges I faced as a from woman. I mean, you know, I got weird questions sometimes about, um, you know, my, my clothing and my Fridays and my Friday afternoons and, you know, 
all that sort of stuff. But for the most part, I think you just have to assert yourself. And, you know, if this is something that's important to you and, you know, you show that and you articulate that, I think people will respect you for it. Now, on the other hand, if, you know, every Friday you have to leave at 11 o'clock because, you know, you have to, uh, you know, you're going away with your family to the wherever, to wherever you're going every weekend, you know, there's, there's limits too. But I think that if it's done in a respectful and fair way and you're willing to sort of work hard to make up for it, I really didn't have people who ever questioned, you know, me needing these sorts of needs for my religion. Everyone was very supportive of me. Um, and then the second part of the question was uh, just going back was sort of um, like, you know, how it was looked at sort of as being a, a unique, not usual decision by a, you know, a from woman in the from community, correct? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, in terms of that, I think that there were definitely people who I remember when I, you know, because I matched the surgery and moved back to the, the city where I, I grew up, which is Denver, because we were living in Israel before that. People were like, wow, you're going to be a surgeon, like, but you have, you know, have kids, like, you know, you're a from woman, like, why not just become a pediatrician? And I mean, I think that that's offensive to both surgeons and pediatricians, honestly. Like, is that saying that pediatrics is not challenging? Is that pediatricians don't get phone calls in the middle of the night? Peds residency is not difficult. I mean, I didn't, I've never done a peds residency, so I don't know. But I got a lot of those sorts of comments that I think it's, you know, more ignorance and, you know, not understanding what a surgeon does, what the training of doctors in general entails, but specifically what surgery residency entails, people just not understanding. Um, and I think, you know, if you go back 30, 40 years, you know, most surgical residency programs were 80%, 90% male, and now it's really 50-50. And so that's sort of changing in our community as well. We're following that trend. But there was nothing about a surgical residency that precluded my ability to be a, you know, from mom and wife um, and to, you know, practice my religion as I saw fit. And I think people, um, at least in Denver, sort of saw that with me being this, you know, person sort of going through this and then saying, oh, we've never seen a from woman do this. Wow, cool. Um, and, you know, now it's a little more prevalent. So, but um, I got those questions and I think you just have to sort of be able to say, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Here's, you know, you don't have to justify yourself to anyone, but. Um, you know, here's what I'm going to do. Here's why. And, you know, this is something I can definitely make work because at the end of the day, it's, it's just a job like any other job. It's so incredible to hear that you, you did get all that support in your, in your work environment. And I guess also probably from your family. Uh, the next question is after residency, were you able to obtain a better work-life balance um, in your family as a wife and mom? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Residency is really, really a tough, you know, arduous time for anyone in any specialty, whether it's one of the road specialties or whether it's, you know, any of the surgical specialties or any and everything else in between. You're still going to have to work nights and weekends. You still are not in control of your schedule. There are still 80-hour work weeks, which are better than 120-hour work weeks, but, you know, there are still weeks where you really are sort of pushing that. And so residency is challenging, and I think the most challenging part of residency is not having control of your schedule from all the things I said. And, you know, once I finished and was able to um, find a place um, in a private practice, I was sort of able to define what I want to do and what I don't want to do um, and say, you know, these are the hours I can work. These are the hours I can't work. And most importantly, these are the days I can work and the days I can't work. And so I uh, was fortunate enough to grew, to join a very, very incredibly supportive group where um, they are so respectful of me and my, my Orthodox religion. And, you know, having never really, you know, interacted much with Orthodox Jews before, but, you know, understanding that now, you know, from Friday evening until Saturday evening, I'm not really um, available to take call. Um, I've worked that into my, um, you know, work schedule and my trauma call schedule where, you know, I take a lot of, you know, almost every Sunday call I take of the month. Um, and I take a lot of Thursday calls, but I don't take Friday calls and I don't take Saturday calls. Um, that way I'm able to um, practice my religion as I see fit. And in terms of other days of the week also, you know, we're all sort of able to say, you know, this is when we want our clinics to start in the morning. And so I like my clinic to start when it starts. That way I can take my kids to school and then head to clinic. Now on days when I'm in the OR starting at, you know, 730, I don't necessarily take my kids to school and we have a wonderful nanny and she's able to sort of do that if my husband's not able to drive them to school that morning either. But, um, these are sort of things that when you are not in residency anymore, you're able to balance and define for yourself and say, yes, I'm willing to give up on taking those extra calls or working those extra hours in the morning or at night 
um, because I want to be able to be home with my family um, or I don't want uh, to work Friday afternoons in the winter because, you know, Shabbos starts at 4.15 and I want to make sure that from 12 until 4, I'm available to take care of all the things and not rushing into the house 10 minutes before um, coming home in an Uber because I wasn't sure if I was going to make it home before Shabbos or not like I did in residency. And so you have a lot more control of that, um, I think, when you um, – are able to find a job after residency. I mean, depending on where you find a job, you know, whether you're hospital employed or in private practice, depending on what your specialty is. But I encourage, you know, anyone listening to this podcast who's at that stage, who's a resident in any specialty, to sort of ask those questions when you go on job interviews um, because they're appropriate questions. It's not like anyone's going to be offended if you say, well, what is the work-life balance in this group? Or, um, you know, how would it work with Saturdays if I take all the Sunday calls and not the Saturday calls? Those are very appropriate questions to not wait until you're signing a contract to then bring up because at that point it's sort of you know a little bit too late sometimes and they're like wait what are you talking about why didn't we bring this up before um but you know to summarize yes i was able to obtain a much better work-life balance um after residency there are still nights that i have to come into the hospital there are still nights i work late there are lots of nights i work overnight like when i'm on trauma call um but that's no different than someone being on a business trip and so you know i take eight trauma calls a month and so i'm gone eight nights a month but the other nights, in general, I'm home to make dinner. I'm home to have dinner with my kids, um, and you know, I'm home to take them to school in the morning. So that's awesome. What new technologies are being incorporated into surgery practice, and do you see these having more of an impact in the future? Um, so new technologies that we've incorporated um, over the last couple of decades are probably more use of um, imaging, uh, diagnostic imaging, um, to um, when, when planning anything or when evaluating a patient, whereas before we relied more on physical examination, now we really are relying more on CT scans and MRIs and MRCPs and endoscopic ultrasounds and whatnot um, in terms of um, planning operations. And uh, the other technology I would say that's being incorporated more into surgical practice is the use of uh, robot, well, use of laparoscopy, but that's been over the last 20, 30 years. And now the advancement from laparoscopy to robotics um, and, impl- you know, I- integrating that into uh, surgery in, you know, specifically in my specialty, we use a lot of robotics, but in a lot of surgical specialties, you know, the spine surgeons are using it now too. Um, a lot of the neurosurgeons are using more, you know, mi- sitting down at microscopes to do surgeries that they were doing open years ago. Um, and so this is not just in general surgery, but a lot of specialties specialties are using it as well, urology, gynecology, et cetera. Um, and in terms of what I see, um, in terms of how these will have an impact on um, uh, the practice of surgery uh, moving forward in the future, I think the new technologies, um, you know, using more studies in terms of evaluating patients will only help us be more thorough and uh, help find more uh, sensitive and specific ways to um, manage problems, not missing things necessarily. The disadvantage of um, such advanced technology and whatnot is sometimes I think we lose sight of the humanistic aspects of medicine and um, the art of the physical exam sometimes gets lost. And so um, if you find yourself on an island and, you know, you don't have all these fancy technologies or your MRI is down for the day, then what do you do? You have to go back to the basics. And I think people lose sight of that sometimes because they're what does the imaging show? They haven't even talked to the patient. They haven't even interviewed the patient yet. They haven't even examined them and they're already like, okay, this is the operation I want to do. And so I think sometimes we have to take a step back and just remember um, and uh, look at the big picture and remember that we're not treating a a machine. We're not treating a uh, CT finding. We're treating a human. Um, And so keep that in mind when integrating these new technologies into practice. And, um, in terms of um, robotics and laparoscopy, um, we just keep getting better at better at using these. Um, I got to tell you, it's really nice to sit down at a uh, console and do an operation sitting with, you know, going home without neck pain, without arm pain. It's it's really, really nice ergonomically. Um, in my specialty, I think there are still places where we won't be doing things robotically because trauma surgery is still trauma surgery. And I don't really see anywhere in the next 10 or 20 years where, um, you know, trauma laparotomies or thoracotomies are going to transition to minimally invasive procedures because when you need to get into a body cavity fast and you need good exposure, still we're going to do it the open way for uh, the foreseeable future. But um, I think I see that um, as um, as time goes on, um, we get more um, facile at using robotic skills. We get faster at doing operations um, that used to take longer um, down in the pelvis, um, you know, more quickly, more efficiently, and more safely. And so I only see these things um, helping um, advance um, surgical practice and being able to deal with surgical problems more expeditiously um, and with better outcomes. 
That is really interesting. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think of like the technology or I thought of the technology that it's, you know, good for the patient because they're minimally invasive. Uh, but also you were saying balancing that with the humanistic aspect. So it's also not great for the patient. Like you're saying, if you never actually do a physical exam on them, um, that's, that's not optimal patient care either. So I guess balancing those two aspects. Exactly. Do you play music in your OR? Yes. <laughs> Most surgeons do. I think there have been some, uh, some studies that have come out, you know, that show that playing music is distracting. And then there have been other studies that have come out that, sh that have shown that, you know, surgeons finish procedures faster if they're listening to music with, you know, certain tempos um, without worse outcomes. Um, and so in general, I think most surgeons do play music in the OR. I'm pretty chill in terms of, uh, you know, what's played. I have rules that are like um, no rap and no country music because um, I don't think that people want to listen to most of the music I would listen to, which is usually like Israeli music or a lot of Jewish music and stuff. I mean, so I'm like, that's fine. If you guys want to listen to Backstreet Boys or, you know, whatever, Imagine Dragons, whatever it is, it's fine. As long as it's not really, uh, really loud rap or um, country, which just really gets on my nerves. I don't care what it is. I'm pretty <laughs> chill about it. On my rotations, I felt like I learned a lot about the surgeons from the music they chose. From their music choices. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, on my, on my preference cards, it really just says, because some people will say, you know, doctor, whoever wants channel, whatever, um, you know, because it's serious XM radio. Um, and mine just says, Dr. Kasai will not listen to country. So, <laughs> like, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with whatever. I just like some background noise. So I don't hear those really pesky anesthesia, you know, the, the machines that keep people alive or whatever are those things anesthesia uses. I don't want to hear those in the background beeping because it makes me nervous. So That's fair. Okay. Uh, next question. If you could go back in time, given the experience and perspective you have now, is there anything you'd want to have done differently? Um. Honestly, I think I would have majored in something else in college. It's like the biggest thing I would have done differently. I majored in biology because I thought that's what you have to major in if you want to, you know, become a doctor. I thought like pre-med, you sort of have to go that route. And no one really ever like encouraged me to do anything else, um, meaning the, the pre-med advisors or whoever. And so I don't know why did I waste my time learning about like invertebrate zoology and ecology and all this sort of stuff that A, I was completely uninterested in and still am kind of grossed out by, but B, um, didn't really help me in med school. Why didn't I major in political science or, um, you know, um, Israeli history or uh, Renaissance history or, or just something interesting and then take the pre-med courses? So I guess, you know, the, the summary of that is not just major in something different, but don't lose interest in the other things you're interested in um, because you have such tunnel vision for like, I'm going to be a doctor. Don't lose your other hobbies, which that I didn't do, but don't be like this is the only thing I can do. You can do other things on the side because I definitely should have majored in something more engaging and something I'm passionate about um, to use those years to cultivate something else that, you know, I don't have a chance to study later in life. So, yeah, I, I think also like college is a time to kind of explore and have a little fun with your interests. And also, and I didn't like, I was so <laughs> tunnel visioned of like, I'm going to go be a doctor. I'm going to be pre-med that I just like told the party line of this is what I have to do. I have to take these classes and I have to take these biology classes because this is part of, you know, being a pre-med major. So I totally shouldn't have done that. Yeah. I think a lot of us fall into that. What advice would you like to leave the pre-med and medical students listening to this podcast with? Gosh, this is a very loaded question. There's a lot. Um, I guess, first of all, and I mean, this goes unsaid, um, you know, medicine is a challenging career um, and it's, you know, it's called the practice of medicine for a reason. It's very humbling. Um, you're always practicing. You're always sort of on a down escalator running up, trying to sort of get better and you can't pause for a minute. There's always continuing medical education um, and there are always ways to improve your skills, improve your knowledge base. Um, it's just never ending. Um, and so keep that in mind when you feel like um, the going is getting tough. I mean, the going is going to still get tough, but it's rewarding. And so um, don't worry if it's been a challenging day, a challenging month, a challenging semester. Um, if you work hard, um, you can achieve what you want to achieve. Just keep uh, plugging away at it. Um, and then I guess number two is just, you know, more specific for JOMA because that's more advice that I'd give, you know, any pre-med or medical student, um, you know, anywhere is um, don't let anyone push you away from, um, from pursuing your dreams. Um, 
it's sure. I mean, I chose a, um, I guess, unconventional specialty for a, um, a from wife and mom, but nothing I do precludes me from being able to be the best um, from Jew wife and mother that I can be. And so I would just uh, keep that in mind when choosing a specialty. Don't rule something out because you think it's posnished or because someone told you that, oh, no one's done that in our community or no one's done that in our, um, you know, neighborhood or no one's done that coming from this, uh, you know, this school, you know, this high school or the seminary or whatever, because those are all irrelevant. No one's done it until someone's done it. And so you could be the one to break that glass ceiling and you'll be fine. Um, and don't let the, you know, also with the haters going to hate um, all the things, you know, well, if you do that, then, you know, you'll never get married, you'll never have kids, any of that sort of stuff. Sure. Were there lots of guys who were intimidated by the fact that um, I wanted to go to medical school and was pursuing that career that said no to me when I was in Shaduchim? Definitely, just like everyone else. But um, there is a right person out there for everyone. And so don't let this career, like medicine in general, or a specialty you want to pursue, um, don't let um, what other people are saying keep you from doing those things. Because if there's a will, there's a way. And Hashem has a plan for each and every one of us. And um, it's not just based on what other people think or say. That shouldn't be what uh, characterizes or um, forms your plan, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's definitely so true. I I mean, even me going into medical school, like, I think I also got some questions. And um, yeah, you got you have to do like what will make you happy. And like you said, it's it's God's will. Um, to, yeah. So but I, I mean, I, I promise you, I mean, I can, I can remember the faces and I can remember the, the names and, and the, the no's and all the people who said no. And, really, and then the people who call and say, are, are you sure your daughter really wants to do this? Are you sure she doesn't want to do PA instead? Like do PA as if it's like you just do it. Like my sister's a PA and it's not you just do it. It's, it's a different career. No, that's not what I want to do. That's not what I want to pursue. And, you know, ultimately there's someone out there for everyone. And, you know, anyone who's going to medical school is incredibly smart and driven and, um, you know, there's an incredibly smart and driven guy out there for every single person. And so don't let those uh, naysayers um, impact um, really important life decisions because um, ultimately you'll regret them and you should do what is right for you in consultation with, you know, your family, your parents, your advisors, your rebellion, your, your teachers, whoever it is that you go to for advice, you know, if those are people you trust, sure, you know, let them help advise you about where to go, um, where to, you know, pursue a residency and stuff like that. But one more thing, I guess, just another piece of advice is when choosing a, a place to go to medical school and a place to do your residency, I know it's hard because, um, you know, you can't always choose, but really, really keep in mind that location does matter. Location matters for, you know, us from Jews more than anyone else in terms of, um, you know, Shmira Shabbos and being able to have um, the things that we need, like schools for kids or mikvos and things like that. Um, you know, I chose to go to medical school in Israel over some other programs in the U.S. domestically because the cities that we were looking at where I was accepted to medical school didn't make sense for us and our family and our kids. Um, it didn't make sense in terms of the schools and the sort of chinuch we wanted um, for our kids. Having a co-ed community school wasn't what we were looking for. And so we said that, you know, actually living in Israel makes more sense for us, makes more sense for, you know, our little kids and the uh, trajectory we want for them. And so so, you know, that, you know, some people would say was a major sacrifice, and I'm glad I made that sacrifice. Um, and making that sacrifice, I still matched to my, you know, first choice program. And so just know that there's a plan out there for everyone. And so, um, you know, go to the places where you need to go to get the support you need, um, whatever that support is at your phase in life. And the same for residency. You know, there were other programs that you know, other than the University of Colorado that I interviewed at, that I was like, you know what, this is a great program. I like the attendings here. I like the residents here. I feel like I'd be a good fit at these programs. And there's one in specific, uh, one specifically in Texas that I could remember that I really, really would have ranked number one, if not for the fact that there was one shoal, there was a, you know, a co-ed school up until fourth grade. And we just said, this, this doesn't make sense for our family. And so I didn't even rank the program. And so keep that in mind when applying to programs and when applying to medical schools, you have other issues. Your life might be more complex. There are other, you know, things you have to take into consideration. But like I said before, God has a plan for every single one of us. And ultimately, ending up back in Denver was perfect because, uh, you know, I was able to, you know, complete my training in a city where, you know, my parents are nearby. I have siblings nearby. I have a great support system. So all those things are really important. And, um, you know, hopefully they work out for everyone, but they will if you sort of, 
you know, uh, don't have tunnel vision and sort of look at the big picture of what you need for your life. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that medicine is a marathon and being in a place that will make you happy and around people who will support you is a huge deal um, for, for your success. Uh, thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Kasai. It was wonderful speaking with you. My pleasure. And I'm sure you have my email address somewhere. Um, Joma has my email and my phone number. And anyone who wants to text me or email me if they want advice or have questions is always welcome to do so. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at Joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A, dot org, or email us at health at joma.org.